guys, this is Ash and you're watching Writer Gash. So today I'm doing my book talk on Rule of Wolves. I read this a few days ago and I needed a little bit of time to decompress after it because it was such an intense book. It was so good. And this book alone basically catapulted the Grisha verse out of this universe. I really got into uh, King of Scars at the like second half of the book. And this book, I was in from the beginning. I think I just needed to get to the reading mindset again because I didn't face the slump that I have been facing with books recently. And it could probably be because I don't have anything else to do right now. I just graduated from college and I have three months before grad school and I have no job at the moment. So all I'm doing is reading and watching TV. So my brain could like fully enjoy it. And it's been a while since I've been able to do that. I could do that in high school, but college really is mentally taxing. I enjoyed being able to enjoy the things that I love again. And yeah, without further ado, let's get into the book talk and talk about Rule of Wolves. This book was freaking amazing. It, the character development in this book, fantastic. Zoya, one of my favorite characters of all time. I relate with Zoya on such a personal level. Like not only do I see myself in her physically, obviously not in every way, but she is a lot more easier to visualize. And also she has these traits that I admire and also she struggles with emotions the way I do. So she's just the per like she, has my ideals and also some of the more realistic things that I connect with, which makes her such a perfect character for me. And I loved reading about her in this book. I think the pacing of this book was absolutely perfect and the character dynamics were chef's kiss. Zoya and Nikolai's relationship developed so well. Nina and Hannah and all of the characters really. I loved reading about the perspectives of the different kingdoms even, like Firda and Shuhan. Just really good book. Without further ado, let's get into the spoilers. So Nina is still in Fierda in this book and she infiltrates Brum's house uh, with the help of Hannah. And the two of them kind of try to help Ravka and the Grisha in the way they can in that moment. She builds Brum's trust and infiltrates the ice court. And at first, when like we met the prince, I can't remember his name, but like when we met the prince, I thought, hey, he might be a good person. He could be a good ally. And he's just someone who has been through a lifetime of hate and he is in pain everyone looks down to him. He could probably relate with people who are also being pushed down in his kingdom and he could be a good ally for them. He thoroughly disappointed me. He was just such a cruel and self-entitled person. The way he hit his guard, just horrible. And then there was also the fact of the guard being the man who killed Matthias in Crooked Kingdom. Oh my god. I couldn't feel Nina's rage waft off the page. And I could feel that rage inside me wanting to punish him. But also, he was just a kid who was misguided by the Fierdens. And he regretted his decision. He had realized that he took an innocent man's life away. But if only he had realized the Fierden ideologies were not just the only right thing. Matthias might have been alive. This whole book, every time I felt like I was rooting for Hannah and Nina, I kept feeling like I was betraying Matthias. Even though I know he's dead and he pro he wanted he would have wanted Nina to be happy. It's just it is it was hard because I've had like after rereading Crooked Kingdom, like Matthias just had such an imprint on me. He was such a great character and it was just hard to let go of him. I never really let go of him. Like when I first read Crooked Kingdom the first time around, 
I didn't know there was a thing called the Grey Showers. I didn't know that Shadow and Bone and Crooked uh, and Six of Crows were connected. And when I finished that book, I decided that Matthias never died because his death could be rewritten with one scene. And in my head, I did that. I do this a lot. If I don't like certain things about certain books, I will rewrite certain things in my head. And I did that with Matthias instead. In my head, he did not die. He survived. The crows parted their way, parted ways and he went to Ravka with Nina. That was my Crooked Kingdom ending. Reading Six of Cro- uh, re- this time around, with the intention of finishing the Grey Showers, I knew I had to get over it. So I gave Hannah a fair shot and she impressed me like i loved her and i loved the way they explored her identity i loved everything about her yes it's just it's been nearly four years well it's been three years of me being in the mindset that matthias never died so i struggled with him being dead because i was in denial and this was a harsh wake-up call. Anyway, so, but despite that, I really did enjoy the development of Nina and Hannah's relationship. And more importantly, Hannah's development as a Grisha, as a person, and her realizing who she is, her identity, and how she feels more herself as in a male body. All of that felt like such character progress. Felt like such good character development. And speaking of Hannah feeling more comfortable in a male body. I do love that she was able to be herself and be free in that way and be able to do the things she wants to even. Being a female in fear that she wouldn't have been able to do. I love that for her. But also I kind of wish it wasn't the princess face she was taking on. I wish she had the luxury because this was something they needed to do. This was the only Thing that could have worked because she did kill the prince and she had to take on his form so she wouldn't get thrown into jail or killed herself so i get that i get that for the storyline but i wish it was so that she would be free to be herself my personal fantasy would be for her and nina to move to either ravka or Keradam, and there they could be themselves and there Hannah could have a male form that she chooses that doesn't look like the man who abused people, abused her even, and where she could freely live as herself and as who she is. And where Nina could still be herself. Because while Hannah is more comfortable in this body and while Nina is okay with being in the fear and body that she chose, but Nina, what I loved most about Nina was how comfortable she was in her own skin and how like she was confident. I loved that. And I loved how much she loved her body. And it just sucks that she can never return to it. Return to it. it sucks that she can not really return to Ravka because she's now the queen of Fierda. She's going to be the queen of Fierda. I love that Hannah and Nina could now have an impact on Fierda's um journey here on out and they can improve fierda's treatment of grisha i respect that but also a lifetime of pretending to be someone else fucking sucks i do wish that at some point they fake their debts and get out of fierda once everything is stabilized and the other thing about that is it's like ravka meddling in fierda in politics like one of the things i hated about what fierda did was I hated that they killed Grisha, off, obviously, but what I hated more was they went beyond their own borders and tried to do things in Ravka, like they tried to kill Grisha in Ravka, they tried to kill Grisha everywhere, and I hated that, like they went and kidnapped Grisha from Ravka, and that's disgusting, because one, Grisha genocide, not great, two, you're crossing your borders and killing people in someone else's kingdom where you have no right to do so and i think that's even worse and Eravka, while their intentions are good now has exceptional power to control fierda's politics 
Because Nina, at the end of the day, is loyal to Ravka. She is loyal to Zoya. Because Zoya and Nina have, like, a really close relationship. And, like, it's either, like, sisterly or a uh, parent-child. Because Zoya looks at Nina as family. Like, she loves Nina. And that feeling, like, Nina respects the hell out of Zoya. And... Obviously, Nina is still loyal to Ravka. She was loyal to Ravka. Like, her morals, yes, matter. But also, her... She will always have that connection to Ravka. And if ever they're faced with a decision that might not actually be good for Fierda's sake, not relating to Grisha, I'm not saying that she shouldn't fight for Grisha to not be murdered. I'm saying if there are actual political things that the two countries, like, is to benefit one and not the other... That's a difficult position to, for her to be in. And Hannah, as great as she is, is easily influenced by Nina. And we see that in this whole book. So that's going to be interesting to see how that navigates. But it's going to be interesting to see how that goes anyway. Moving on, let's talk about Nikolai and Zoya's story. Their dynamics in this book were amazing. It developed from a very healthy friendship to a healthy romance, in my opinion, where there is mutual respect and trust, and that is such a good foundation for a relationship. Um, when one of my favorite scenes in Nikolai's point of view was when Nikolai announced that he gave the Zemini the skies, while Ketterdam, sorry, while the Kirch could have the ocean. Perfect. Speaking of weaponry, I wanted to talk about something that really made me cry in this book. And that was David's death. Nikolai faked the whole wedding thing with the Queen of Shuhan and said it. Instead of getting married himself to the princess, it was actually Jenna and David's wedding. Wedding, And Zoya had been gone because she was dealing with the Darkling and she was meeting with Alina and Mal. Where the Darkling escapes, which was really fun because, hmm, I really hated the Darkling in this book. But also, we really got to see another side. Like, a we got to see how in his head he was always working for Ravka. He was trying to help Ravka. And he does in like his own way. But that doesn't redeem him. It just shows how... It just shows us his perspective. But he's still not a great guy. Anyway, we see... After the wedding, David goes away because he has some idea or something. And the Fjordans bomb assault her. And David dies. Fucking loved David. I remember just reading those words and like my f and crying and it was just painful, like so utterly painful. And the worst part is it wasn't even at the end, so we barely got David. It was just like it felt like it was right off the bat. It was maybe in the middle-ish, early middle. But it was just... I can't believe we lost him. We lost him too soon. And his funeral, where we saw Jenya... It was painful. Like, it was honestly one of the most painful scenes. We didn't get to see... Like, we didn't get to experience losing him. We just got the aftermath. And I hate that. We got that with Hersha in the shadow and in, in like Ruin and Rising. I hated that. That was like my least favorite thing about Ruin and Rising where we lost Hersha, but we never got to see us losing him. We just fought. it was like a mention at the aftermath that amongst the casualties, he was one of them. And it felt like that. Like we created such a bond with David from the very first book of this universe. And we lost him like that. And I think Lee Bardugo does that. Like, she kills off main characters without remorse. And I know this makes it so much more realistic. Like, this is what would happen in a real war. 
but I don't read so I can feel like it's realistic. I want to feel happy at the end of it. And it's really hard to feel happy when you face such losses. And these characters at this point felt so real to me. And I finally formed the bonds with them that I needed to and it was just really hard losing them. Moving on, let's talk about Zoya's incredible development. Like she becomes so vulnerable and open throughout this book. And she, at the end of this book, she has developed such empathy. She can look past her hate for the Darkling and say, hey, we shouldn't make anyone suffer that way for the rest of eternity, keeping the fold open with a coin in their heart. And the empathy that we see in her is just respectable. In the way she's vulnerable with Nikolai, telling him about her past, telling him about how her mother sold her off, telling him about her. And I love like seeing her one, and I love seeing her vulnerable with Nikolai and forming that bond with him because it was so crucial for their journey together. And then that scene in the ship when they were returning from Ketterdam, it's just beautiful. Speaking of Ketterdam, can we talk about how epic that heist was? Well, it was just like a tiny scene, I get that, but we got to see Kaz again and how we got to see Kaz again and how he basically decided to help Nikolai for Inez's sake. And uh, I, I'm disappointed that Kaz isn't a closer to Jesper and Wylan. But I also get it because like Wylan's a merchant, Kaz is a criminal. But I love the way they've gone and their personal journeys and how they still keep in touch. I do wish we got to see Inej at that point, but I get that she was off uh, getting rid of uh, slavers and all. But I, I, I was confused at this. I was confused about the state of Kaz and Inej's relationship, cause like, it wasn't clear. But it was probably because we got it from Nikolai and Zoya's point of views instead of Kaz and Inej's. Anyway, speaking of Zoya. That scene with her and the Suli in Ketterdam and her finally embracing that part of herself was amazing. And that was another one of those moments where her vulnerability really impressed me. And the way I love the heritage touch there and how the Suli take care of their own. That is such an important thing. And then another one of my favorite scenes was Zoya the dragon showing up and killing the battle and winning the Fjordans. Like the way she spared their life, the way she showed mercy and she was the better person kind of won the Fjordans over. She won the common people and made them think of her as a saint and thus building herself and Ravka up. And that is what got her on the throne at the end, the way she like created this aura around her like this whole image of her being the dragon saint and when Nikolai gives up his throne for Zoya that was the perfect solution I was worried about how they were going to deal with the whole thing about Nikolai not being related to the king but then him talking about how the first Lansoff king was create uh, wasn't appointed because of his actions and his sainthood and blah 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 or something like that and how Zoya had just displayed these same things and she deserved it and she he basically bows to her and says I would I want I support her being queen that was fantastic and then like the way she claimed all parts of herself her the fact that she was a soldier the fact that she was a Su a Grisha and a Suli. Like, I love that she publicly announced she was a Suli. And I do hope that I know Rav can treat Suli horribly. And I hope this, uh, the queen being a Suli helps the kingdom progress in their treatment of Sulis and Grishas. Everyone here is so freaking prejudiced. And then we also have this one scene at the end with Inej and Nina. Well, we don't really get to see it after Inej meets Soya. She goes with the queen or like the king of Fierda's, the prince of Fierda's 
fiance or whatever. And obviously she knows, right? Because like Inina wouldn't lie to Inej about it. So like I love the idea of them having a reunion. I do hope Nina can keep in touch with her friends, with the crows, because being a royal probably limits her movements a lot, especially of female in Fierda. But I hope they do better for the girls of Fierda, because Fierda needs reforms. <laughs> now, before I end the book talk, I wanted to talk about the Darkling real quick. The Darkling, clearly a manipulative asshole, clearly selfish, and. Uh, but we also get to see how, in his head, he is doing everything he is doing for Ravka. When he announces Zoya as a saint, he's the first person to call her a saint when she is the dragon. He does it for Ravka's sake. And when he plays a role in getting rid of the apparat, he does it for Ravka's sake, because the apparat's a slimy pig. And at the end, he helps fly, fight the blight, even, for Ravka, for their world, for the Grisha. Because in his head, he's, everything he has done was to protect the Grisha. And his intention in the beginning might have been good. It's just warped. And in a way, he just craves being the center of attention. And it's just all toxic. But I get like his goal. And this is not a defense of him. Not in any way at all this is just me acknowledging that in his head everything he did was for Ravka and the Grisha more than anything else but that does not mean he's not responsible for every disgusting thing he has done for everything he did to Zoya for everything he did to Alina for everything he did to Jenya without him a lot of people would have been a lot better off but also we don't know how the Grisha would have done without him so it is extremely complicated. He is clearly the vil villain. He is clearly a bad person. But it's still complicated talking about him. Because he did play a huge role in this universe. In almost, he's probably impacted every single person, every single Grisha's life at the very least, in some way or another. And it was always for selfish reasons, obviously. But at some point, he could have been a better person. And that's just the one thing that saddens me. Anyway, so... Also, at the end, it sets up for the perfect Six of Curse 3. Although, I'm not sure how I feel about it. Basically, in Zoya needs something found for her. She needs the curse to do a heist. And like Nikolai even goes to tell Kaz about it. And I would be happy to have a book about the crows again. Like, I would love it more than anything else. You know what I would absolutely hate? If they killed off Violin, or Jasper, or Cash, or Inej. Because they surely will kill one of them off. Because that's how... Like, in every one of her series, at least some kind of main character has died. Matthias... Um, Hersha, he's not a main character, yes, but he is kind of an important character. Like, he's one of the people on their Grisha and Mal crew in <laughs> Ruin and Rising, so he felt, he was important to me. So Matthias, Hersha, and now David. I just don't want to lose anyone else, which is why I don't want Six of Frost 3, but Six of Frost 3 would be so epic! And it would be such a good book. He could do a duology again, name it something else. And also, the Six of Crows. Not, I'm not saying name it Six of Crows. I'm saying something in Ketterdam with the Crows wouldn't be the same without Nina. And with Nina being the future queen of fear, it would be hard to do. But I sure as hell hope that if they do, if... Lee Bardugo does write Six of Crows 3. She includes Nina as one of the members of the crew. Because it just wouldn't be the same without her. Anyway, so that is it for my really long book talk. With the series progressing, I liked this even more and more. Lee Bardugo got so much better writing characters as she went on. I think it's it helps to have it in third person rather than first, honestly. Anyway, so that's it for my book talk. I hope you guys enjoyed this series as much as I did and you guys have a great day!